Welcome to day three. Uh, the theme of today is uh, the life fiction. This is a concept from Adler. He was a, a peer, a colleague of uh, Freud and Jung in the uh, psychoanalytic society. Uh, eventually fell out with Freud and they parted company. But I think Adler had some very, very interesting things to say about how people organize their thoughts and their lives and the way they think about who they are as a person and the way they live. And it's so different to the way Freud and Jung approach it. Um, and really functional, really practical. And in some ways, it's almost like, uh, it's almost more like motivational psychology at times. This particular idea of Adler's, of the life fiction, is interesting. Um, it has a couple of elements to it. One of them is, as the name suggests, that we're living a narrative. We're living a story of who we are. And the story is a story. It's not based on truth. It's called a life fiction. It's, a, it's an idealized version uh, based on you know, drama and other stories and mythologies that we've taken on uh, and certain archetypes as well. Even if the story is bad, when I say idealized, it doesn't mean you're making it more romantic and sound cooler than it is. It's that it is not a representation of fact. It's not a representation of truth. Some people find this idea offensive. Um, I find it freeing. I find it challenging, but I find it freeing. One of the things that I'm aware of, though, and I don't think is particularly common knowledge, is just how fragile memory is. We think we remember the past, but uh, the best psychologists and neuroscientists in the field tell us it's extremely unlikely that we actually remember the past, especially the further away you go or the more traumatic the event was. It's far more likely that we're remembering a memory of a memory of a memory of a story that we told ourselves with a huge amount of information deleted, most of the information deleted. And the few bits and pieces that we kept were based on our prejudices, our filters, and our map of reality. The mind distorts, deletes, and generalizes, not because it's not functioning, because it is functioning. Your mind is supposed to do this. Because how could we possibly take on reality cold? How could we take on reality unadulterated? There's way too much to know. There's way too much to take on. So even now, as you're watching this, you are deleting. Your mind is simply ignoring the overwhelming majority of information that you're receiving right now so that you don't go crazy, so that you can concentrate for a few minutes on what I'm saying and take something from this that is functional. You're deleting a huge amount of sensory information, visual information, auditory information, a huge amount of uh, just stimuli from the environment. You just have to say, no, I don't want that. One of the things that uh, psychedelics do, and particularly acid does, is it sort of, um, it doesn't damage, but it, it interferes with this reality filter and sort of holds it open too wide for a while which is why we get this sense of overwhelm. If anybody's ever taken acid, you would know that. The visual stimuli you're getting don't fit into the schemata they're supposed to. The auditory stimuli you're getting is not going into the boxes it should go into. It feels very, very chaotic because your ability to filter and put things into neat, tidy boxes and shove them away is damaged. So of course we're living a life fiction. We have no choice. Of course our memories don't function properly because we're not having a memory of an event. We're having a memory of a memory of a memory of a story that we told ourselves when 90% of the information was simply deleted and the 1%, it's not 99 and 1%, please academics don't shout at me, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to convey something metaphorically. It's not that percentage, nobody knows what the percentage is, but it's the overwhelming majority. The 1% that we do take is distorted through our filters, cultural, familial, trauma-based, politics, uh, uh, philosophy of life, value system, 
So what do you end up with? You end up with what would charitably be called a story, less charitably be called a fiction, and if we're being very uncharitable, we would call it a lie. It is a lie. We don't even remember that lie. We have a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. Knowing this gives us, or could give us, could give one, a sense of humility in terms of what we think we know. We can't even trust our own memories. What do we really know? When we're very certain, when we're very convinced, how did we get so certain? How did we get so convinced that what we think to be true about reality is true? The map of reality that we hold in our heads, we need it. The fiction of reality, the story of reality that we hold, we need it. But maybe we can afford to be flexible. Maybe we can afford to be a little softer in our assertion of the way things are, because we don't really know to a nicety, to a nuance. We can't. I'm not saying throw it all out. As I say, you need your fictions, you need your narratives, you should have one. But it means that we have the scope to choose a better one. We have the scope to choose a healthier one. We have the scope and the flexibility to choose one that perhaps more accurately reflects reality, rather than just being, because if it was a spectrum, you have a story, you never have reality, you'll never have the truth, but you have a spectrum, very untruthy, more truthy. If you get down to this side of the spectrum, where you're relying more on the data and more on what is likely to have been true and not this, which is steeped in prejudice and presupposition and filters and very often, quite frankly, trauma and emotional dysregulation because emotional dysregulation warps our perceptions. This is where we want to be. We want to try and slide up the scale this way. So we live a life fiction. And the other challenging idea that he gave us was Whatever it is you're doing now, that's what you want to be doing. And you might think, oh, hang on a second, I've just come out of a terrible relationship or I'm not employed or you know, this thing has happened or that thing has happened or I'm having these problems in my life. What a ridiculous idea to say that these are things I want in my life. I wouldn't take it as literal truth, but every once in a while when I'm thinking and I'm trying to do better, I just let that thought come in and I wrestle with it a little bit and I say, to what extent and in what, if, if it was like, this is philosophy, not psychology now. If it were true that I wanted this challenge in my life, what purpose would it serve? If it were true that I, at some unconscious level, I'm living like an unconscious script where I've brought, I've manifested this situation, why would I be doing that? What would I be seeking to learn? And this can be useful. It's not a question. Don't get caught in the weeds of like, it's literally true or it's not literally true. Is it useful? And I think more often than not, when you consider your life in terms of a narrative and your attitudes in terms of a life fiction, and you look at your life and you start to say, where would I want this? How would I, how could I say that I want this painful, awkward thing that's draining my patience and frustrate? Why would I want this? you can start to come up with answers. And you say, well, maybe I'm trying to learn X, Y, or Z about the situation. It's just an alternative way of viewing life and viewing your problems that I think if you wrestle with them, you can learn from them. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. And I look forward to speaking to you again tomorrow. Cheers.